Committee Oral History Project, April 30th, 2012. I'm Ginger Kettleson and I'm interviewing Susan Wilson at her home, 403 Red Oak in Rochester, Michigan. Uh, Susan, thank you for consenting to share your family history with us. Um, a good place to start is at the beginning, so would you tell us about your own birth, where, when, how, and so forth, and your family? Okay. Um, well, I'm Susan Seward Wilson. Um, I believe I was born at St. Joe in Pontiac, and I did not look that up, but I've lived all my life in Rochester. Uh, I know that when I came home from the hospital, we lived at the third house on the west side of Main Street, the third house on the west side, um, and down from Albertson when we came home. And uh, that house is still there, which is very nice. Um, I was raised at 303 Glendale, on the corner of Glendale and Piney. Um, my grandparents, do you want me to go that far? Absolutely. Okay, my grandparents were Thelma and Leon Ferrier. My dad's side, on my mother's side, on my dad's side uh, was Adolph Seward and his wife Elfrida Seward, and she was a Giebert. Um, that went along with the Gebert hardware. Um, do you want your to parents? My parents? 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 My parents, yes. Um, my mother was Lucille Ferrier, and my dad was Kenneth Seward. And then, okay, and we have a, a family tree chart, so those interested could find out more. Siblings? Siblings, I have two brothers. I have a younger brother, David, and an older brother, Paul. Um, Paul lives in Mississippi, and David lives in Atlanta, Georgia. All right. Your father's occupation, family business? Um, my father worked at National Twist Drill uh, most all of his life. Before that, he worked on farms with um, uncles and some of his grandparents and different things like that. Um, but his main, uh, he retired from National Twist Drill, and I don't know the year, but I would say it was probably around 80, I don't know for sure. Um, he was a setup man for all of the ladies that didn't go to war in 1942. Um, he started, I believe they were, uh, they built National Twist Drill in 1942. And he went to work there as soon as it opened. And he was a setup man and set up all the machinery okay. that um, the women were going to have to run while the men were off to war. Um, he had three brothers. Um, he actually had more than that, but um, three of them were already in the service. And um, he didn't have to go because of his priorities here at National Twist Row. My mother was a teller at uh, National Bank of Rochester, at the Big Bank Building, downtown Rochester. Um, my parents divorced when I was 10 years old, in 1953. Um, and I was granted, well, my, my dad went to court and um, got custody of all three of the children so that we were all stayed home on Glendale Road. I wanted to be, so that was a good thing. Um, you want to tell us about school? Well, I went to Woodward School. Um, it was a half a block away, so I got to go home for lunch every day. Um, that was kind of a nice thing. Um, I can remember at the Woodward School, we had um, always had to take two cents with us to school so that we could go downstairs uh, and buy our milk. And it came in little pint bottles about this big. And uh, I, I remember that because even in the wintertime, we had to go out the front doors and in another door right next to the front doors to go down the stairs. You couldn't get down the stairs unless you went out front. And it was always so cold and everybody hated to go. I mean, of course, we all had to wear dresses back in that time. I mean, you never wore pants. Nobody had jeans or anything like that. Um, I had... 
um, Mrs. N. Sign from my kindergarten teacher. I can't remember my first and second grade, but my and it only went to the third grade. My third grade teacher was Mrs. Francis, and when the school closed and they were going to tear it down, they had a sale, and I was able to go over there and I got the transom that was over top of our third grade classroom. And I also got the railing that went down the stairs where we always had to go downstairs to get our milk. I bought that railing too. <laughs> so and I have and you have those here in your home. I have uh, well, my daughter has the railing because she bought a new home and she wanted to put it in her home. All right. And um, I have the transom. Yes, I do. All right. All right. Um, do you have any memorable school events that would give us a picture of Rochester when oh. you were in elementary or high school? Well, I went after Woodward School. I went to fourth grade at Central, which was. Um, a long hike because you had to live a mile and a half away from school in order to take a bus and we didn't live a mile and a half away because we could cut through Hallback Field and the park and be there so it, it didn't take that long. Um, my junior high years uh, over there, fourth, fifth grade I had Mrs. Um, Bur Miss Burkett. Miss Burkett. And uh, Miss Burkett would always um, take us downtown <coughs> to the um, bowling alley that was underneath the record shop downtown on Main Street. It sat on the east side. Uh, I believe it might have been under the varsity shop when it was over there, or I I'm not really sure. But anyway, between uh, Fourth and University, between Fourth and Fifth, Fifth Street, correct. And um, I can remember. That's how I learned to bowl, and I'm still bowling today. Um, Miss Burkett was a special lady. She um, she was very, very kind to everybody, and I think everybody remembers her as being probably one of their favorite teachers. She was she was good. Um, I had Mr. Hatherley. I had Mr. Giroux. I had Mr. Peters, Herb Peters, and uh, Herb Peters just passed away a year ago, and. Uh, I got to know him even better after, uh, well, within the past few years. Um, he would come over here and ask me to type up pages for him. Um, he didn't have a typewriter and he didn't know how to type. And I thought, well, my English teacher doesn't know how to type and doesn't have a typewriter. That's interesting. So he would come over here and unfortunately he would stay for hours and he'd have to call his wife and tell her that he didn't get lost, that he's still here. Um, because he was such a historian in Rochester. He knew everybody, where they lived, who they married, where their kids are, what their names are. He was just a huge historian. Anyway, I had Mr. Peters. Um, I think Mr. I said Mr. Hatherley. Um, oh, oh, who is the school named after out on Sheldon? Um, Hugger. 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 Oh, Fred Hugger. Fred Hugger. Uh, he was another one of my teachers. Um, and that's that's about it. I took band, so I had, of course, Mr. Ward T. Reed. Um, I played clarinet in the marching band, and. Um, that's about it. Okay. High school. <laughs> okay. What about your friends uh, growing up and the kinds of things you did with your oh, friends? Oh my goodness, I can't tell all those things, but um, I was very good friends with Mary Cromie, Marilyn Cross, Donna Swanson, um, Jim Hopkins went to kindergarten with me through third grade and then we went up to the high school and I had such a crush on Jim Hopkins, it was unbelievable. And he has school pictures that his mother took. <laughs> and I'm sitting next to Jim everywhere we were. And that was from third grade when we went to the Henry Ford Museum. <laughs> and uh, and he knows it. I mean, he's, I, I said, look, at, there I am right next to you again. <laughs> so he knew that I had a real crush on him all through school. 
Anyway, um, they were good friends. Um, Marilee was uh, a, an especially good friend, Marilee Cross. She um, had dated my husband, and uh, that's how I met my husband. I was sitting on the front porch at Marilee's house. She lived on Fifth Street University um, in a house right at the end of Ludlow where Ludlow comes out. They were, and they've taken the front porch up, but they had a big front porch all the way across the house. And her and I were sitting out there on the front porch, of course, leaving to guys as they went by and all that kind of stuff. And the two guys went by and tooted their horn at us and we waved and they turned on to Ludlow because they were on their way to the baseball games to see if there were any good looking chicks there. <laughs> and they came back and they knew Marilee, of course, and so they parked around the corner and came over and I can remember Rod got grease all over his pant leg for some, I don't know what he got into, but probably their old car that they were driving that didn't have a four in the back seat. Um, anyway, that was our, uh, how I met my husband after uh, Marilee had met his best, my husband's best friend, Daryl Cooper, on the Bob boat. So that's how they all got together, so. Okay. And that was my friends. Um, what are your happiest memories from your childhood? Um, I think the very happiest memories were our times that we could play outside um, in the evenings. We went over to the Woodward School and we had so many kids boys, girls, what have you, that always got together and we'd play everything from baseball and they let us play. The girls could play because they had to fill up all the bases, you know. And so they'd let the girls play outfield probably. Um, but we um, we had Monty Clue, Howard Hankel, um, the Wilsies, there were three of them, Barbara, Richard, and Bruce. Um, there were the Sherbys that lived on Ferndale. There was uh, Susie Bridge, was my very best friend all through elementary school. Her and I knew each other from the time we could walk and I could go up to her house because we both lived on Glendale. Um, and her brother Gary, and Gary was killed when he was 16 uh, in a very terrible accident on Dutton, out by Dutton Road, on Oregon. Anyway, um, um, let me see, there was a Mitzelfield, Stearns, um, McGowan, I don't know if I said him, um, Penny Gray, um, it, it just goes on and on and these are all the people that would gather every night. We'd play hide and go seek after dark, which was even more fun because it was dark. <laughs> and it was safe enough in those days your parents would let you stay out after Oh, dark. absolutely, absolutely. We didn't have to be home until 9 o'clock and on weekends it was... You know, we could stay out until <clears throat> most of us had to be home by 9 or 10 o'clock. But we were only half a block away, so they knew where we were, too. Um, do you recall any hardships as during your growing up years? Um, the hardships were after my parents divorced. Um, I was the only girl in the house, um, which was hard for me because I couldn't have pajama parties or anything like that because the only people there were men. Um, it, it caused a few problems, but I was happy to be at, at home with my family rather than with my mother who remarried. And uh, this, uh, I wanted to be with my dad. Had she moved to another community? No, oh. she, she was here in town. Uh, Let's talk about employment. What are what was your first job, and what kind of jobs did you have? Well, my very first job was babysitting, and uh, that was a very difficult task because I had every day after school I had six kids that I babysat for and had to make their dinner. My parents didn't get home until about seven, and I made fifty cents an hour. Okay. That'll uh, make everybody today cringe. <laughs> and as an adult? I, okay. Um, I went on to, uh, after I got married, I never had a job before I got married, besides babysitting. Um, I got married uh, three months after I graduated from high school in 1961. And um, I 
did not go to work until after both of my children were in kindergarten. So in 1974, my mother was working for Adams High School and she said they had some openings and would I like to fill out a um, application to work at the schools. So I did and I had an interview. At that time I was uh, co-president of the Rochester Sets, which was a separate organization from the JCs at the time. Um, and she said, I, do you have enough time? The lady that was interviewing me said, do you have enough time with all of your busyness and, uh, to work? And I said that I really thought that I did. So she hired me and I worked at Van Hoosen Middle School. I was a secretary. Uh, I was a media clerk to begin with for 18 years at Van Hoosen. And then they eliminated the media clerk's position. So I then went... I put in an application to work in the counseling office because that was one of the jobs that was open. And I was third on the seniority list by that time. So um, I took the jobs in the counseling office and I was there for eight years and then I retired in 1998. Okay, very good. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, your marriage and your children next. Okay. Uh, well, as I said, I married Rod in 1961, and uh, he had graduated from Rochester, or from, excuse me, he had graduated from Waterford Township High School. And um, we had dated for three years before that. I met him in, well, it wasn't quite three years, it was probably only two. Uh, in 1959, I met him. Um, and we dated, and he broke up with me, and we dated, and he broke up with me, and we dated, and he broke up with me, <laughs> in the same way that everything goes with everybody today, I suppose. Um, but we um, got married in 1961 at St. Paul's Methodist Church, and it was the very small St. Paul's on Romeo. Um, and we attended church there. Um, we stayed at home at my father's to help with my younger brother because um, when my parents divorced, David was only two and a half. And he was not old enough to just stay by himself. So we lived at my dad's house and helped raise my brother until he was you know, a teenager. And then we bought a house, and it was on Parkdale, um, second from the corner on the south side of Parkdale from Elizabeth Street. Um, it's still there, it still has the same siding on it that we put on it when we lived there. Um, it was an older home, in fact my grandfather came down one time and he said, I remember back in, uh, whatever, <laughs> he said, I remember plastering after dark, that spot up over top of that doorway. And I, I just thought that was too cute, that that was his business. And he had worked on that particular house and, and knew it very well. Um, we lived there until 1976, and then we moved to this home on Red Oak in 1976, and we have been here ever since. And your children? My children. Um, Debbie was born in 1963. She's my oldest. Sherry was born in 1968. Uh, she was my youngest, and I had just the two children. Um, they are both married um, and have two girls each. Um, I have granddaughters, Melanie and Megan, and Kayla and Taylor. But Sherry had Kayla and Taylor, so. Okay. Uh, you and Rod have been very, very involved in the community for many, many years. Mm. Can you share with us some of the highlights of all of that <laughs> civic involvement? Well, civic involvement. Um, we started out volunteering. We have never done anything but volunteering. Um, my, our first I guess volunteering job was I'm trying to think of if it was the it was the the parents club because our daughters were both 
in the Rochester High School Falconettes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and with that, that was a traveling competition team. And so we had to travel all over Ohio, Indiana, Chicago, uh, many, many different places. Um, and Rod was president of the Parents Club. Uh, it was a very organized um, dance competition, cheerleading dance competition. And uh, Debbie, my oldest daughter, won a trip to Hawaii Ooh. to compete in the Pro Bowl that they have in Hawaii every year. And uh, the, we had won a national competition, um, I think that year, and that it was part of an all-American group. And when you belong to that, you go to Hawaii. When, if you're, I guess you have to re reach a certain status in your own community, right, doing your dance drill. And she attained that, so she was able to go to Hawaii. So that was that was a great thing. After that, um, Debbie graduated, Sherry graduated, and we. And I have to say that Rod went to school. He had been going to school for ever. He went to the Pontiac Business Institute, which people probably don't even know existed, uh, for years. Um, got some a lot of courses and everything, but then he decided he was going to go to Central and get his degree. Um, he felt that working with General Motors, he had to have his degree in order to advance there. So for two years, we probably didn't do anything. He worked full time um, and went to school full time. Mm -hmm. So therefore, um, we had a pact uh, that <laughs> when that door over there was closed and he was in the dining room doing his work, that we didn't bother him. And, you know that it made it a little difficult. It was, it was difficult for two years for him to. In this See, full time, the girls were still at home. Oh yes, the girls yeah. were still at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, so after he got his degree, um, we started. Well, we did a puzzle over his two weeks off in um, between Christmas and New Year's. And we always had a grandma's table over there, so we we could do a big puzzle. So we decided to do a Coca Cola puzzle. So we put, it was oh, 2,000 pieces, or 1,000 pieces, 2,000 I believe. But anyway, we did this puzzle, and then we decided, well, it's kind of cool, let's frame it. And so we framed it and hung it up on the wall, and me and my big mouth, I said, gee, I wonder if people actually collect that stuff, you know, <laughs> which wasn't too smart on my part. But anyway, um, I have an obsessive husband who likes to get everything. So we decided that we were going to collect everything that was in that puzzle. Well, that took us all over the country. We, we did everything to buy everything that we could get to go in that puzzle. And he was president of the Michigan Coca-Cola Collectors Club, the CCCC. <laughs> <laughs> so any, um, that took up a lot of time. While we were out looking for that kind of thing, the Coca-Cola, my uncle started bringing, my mother's brother, started bringing things over to me that he was finding in his attic. He was cleaning out his house because he was getting on in years and he wanted to clean out some things. So I decided that uh, it would be nice if I collected some Rochester things. I was finding Rochester things while we were finding Coca-Cola. So we started collecting Rochester things and Coca-Cola. Um, thus, we have amassed a huge collection of Rochester memorabilia. And Coca-Cola And Coca-Cola memorabilia, yes. Um, after his Coca-Cola, he joined the Rochester Avon Historical Society. And to my surprise and not my surprise, uh, they were doing their video at that time. Um, can't remember the title of it. I'm sorry, I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we'll look that up. Um, anyway, uh, he called 
they had, I think it was Kathy McAfee was the actual one who was head of that and asked her if they needed somebody to help with money raising. Now that would be the last thing I would do. <laughs> I would not ever go asking for money, but that didn't bother him. So he did that, and in six months he was on the board of the Registry of Historical Society. And as soon as they had elections, he became president of the Historical Society. Um, all in all, he's been president of the Historical Society for 14 years. And not doing all the work himself. You've been a oh, support well, staff. There. Absolutely. I mean, we yes. we have worked together on on everything. And I'm going to put a little interruption here. Sue and Rod's home is a museum. They have an incredible collection of Rochester memorabilia on the main floor and the Coca-Cola memorabilia in the lower level. Uh, quite a unique place and always open to people who would like to come and visit. Absolutely. We do tours of our home. We have a special folder on our computer that has tours of our home and I take a picture of everybody who comes over and puts it into that folder so that we know how many people we've had. And I didn't start that at the beginning, unfortunately, so. But, but I think it's fun to have. The two of you are way up on top of the list of people who have made the preservation of the story of Rochester available and interesting and ongoing to so many of us. And I hope so. We, we certainly have tried to. Anything else about your involvements in the community that you'd like to add? Well, I have to say that um, through the Historical Society, um, the book that was put together in our lower level um, won an award from the Historical Society of Michigan. We also won an award for our newsletter. We won an award for our film that was made the movie. Um, Mark Krim had narrated that movie, so that, that was a big plus. Um, we have won an award for doing our, um, uh, the mural at the Rochester High School, um, the old central that I attended and now is the board office, um, had a mural painted in 1937. Um, it was a WPA project, which is the Works Progress Administration, I believe. And it was painted by Marvin Beerbaum. And one of the fun things I have to say about that is when we got into doing this, we found out that Marvin Beerbaum had given some of his things to the Smithsonian. Uh -huh. And there was a box there, and so Rod contacted the Smithsonian and made an appointment. and. We went to Washington, D.C. and got to go in, and, and I can't tell you what, it, what it's like. I mean, there's someone sitting at a desk over here, and you're at a table over here, and they watch everything you do. Uh, you can take one page out at a time and put it back, and take another page out at a time. And so we started out at the front of this box, and we got into one of the folders, and we pulled out a picture of... Marvin Beerbohm painting our mural, which was, you can't imagine the shock and the awe, and I mean, it was just one of those moments that you can't imagine happening. And there was also, there were two pictures, one of them mounting it over the windows, over the front door. Original. The original, yes. And uh, one of him painting it, and, and that was superb. Um, so we won an award for that from the Michigan. Were you Historical allowed Society. to be photographed? No, nothing. Nothing. No. But we did. Uh, Rod contacted the lady that we talked to originally again, and they made a di digitized um, photo of these two pictures, and we and sent them to us so that we could use them. Not in the newspapers, but we could use them for the presentation when we got it finished and we'd be on the wall at the school and so on. So that that was a super thing. Um, I, I don't know exactly 
how to say that we just received the President's Award. The Presidential, Presidential Volunteer Award from, from President Obama. From pres and the letter from President Obama. And that that was very significant and we were very humbled by that. That, that was wonderful. Congratulations and well Thank deserved. <laughs> well deserved. Um, changing a little bit here. Um, Contrast the changes. How, how different is Rochester now to when you were young, and how do you feel about all of that happening? Hmm. Well, I've often said that I wish they'd have closed the gates a long time ago, <laughs> because Rochester was totally different when I was growing up. Um, we never locked our car, locked our house. Uh, we leave the keys in the car overnight. Um, it, it was just such a safe, small town to live in that nobody ever worried about anything. Crime was abso absolutely not happening here at all, as far as everybody here was concerned. Um, and like I said before, we were able to play outside until after dark, and, and nobody worried about anything happening to us. Um, it's, it's changed in that respect, but, but the whole world changed when we got the internet. I think it's, it's uh, definitely everybody can contact each other at any moment all over the world now, and that makes it a lot different just in itself. Um, we didn't have TV, which, <laughs> which is hard to believe, but... Um, we couldn't just sit at home. If we sat at home, we had to listen to the radio. And um, it, it's just changed so drastically. I loved our neighborhood because any other place, I don't think, would have had the kind of neighbors that I have, that, that I had. Um, I can't remember if I listed all the people that lived in my neighborhood. I listed the kids. The kids you were talking about. Well, in, right straight across the street from us was Lou Mitzelfield, who was, I believe, the superintendent of National Twist Drill. And next door to him was Roy and Bev Rewald. And next to him was Harry Lytell's son. Um, across the street from Harry was um, Tracy's. Um, and I always called her Grandma Tracy because she was... The Stearns, Chuck Stearns, was one of our fun mates that we had in school. Um, his grandmother was Tracy, was Mrs. Tracy, but everybody called her Grandma Tracy. Um, and on the other, Harold Miller was a, a music teacher at high school, so um, he lived on our street. In the other way, we had the Arnolds who lived across the street from us, and she was Travis's, his, he was the um, operator of the paper mill, Mr. Travers, Travis. Okay. And she was his secretary. Next door to him, or to them, was Harry Lytell, and he owned the oil company in town, and across the street was Dr. Woodruff, and there was Chuck Stearns, um, there was my friend Susie, who lived in the next house, and it just... It seemed like our neighborhood had a lot of influential people that we look back on and know their names now, like Missilefield, Rewald, and um, it didn't mean anything when we were kids. They were just our neighbors, <laughs> you know, and I had no idea. And I found out through my family tree when we did our genealogy that Martha Seward, which is my dad's, my maiden name, married Frank Rewald, the oldest Frank Rewald. So my grandfather, my grandfather and Martha were brother and sister. And so I, I didn't know that for years and years and years. And I asked my dad one day, why didn't you tell me? And he said, you never asked. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of relationships that you have in it, Besides friendships, there are yes. actual family relationships. Yes, and I, I am, but I never knew. But the, that's the way it was back then. You just accepted everybody, you know, as friends, and everybody got along. Everybody has fights. But 
I don't remember any fighting in our neighborhood with all those kids, and there were lots of kids. Um, I, I do remember one fun thing that I just have to interject. Uh, behind Chuck Stearns' house, and this is Carl Stearns who owned the, the theaters downtown Rochester, um, behind them there were no homes or anything all the way over to Tinkham. We had fields that we could just play in and run in and toboggan in and so on and so forth. But there was one great big huge apple tree behind his house. And the boys in the neighborhood got the big idea that how fun it would be to dig underneath that tree, underneath the roots, and have all the, a big hut to play in, you know, to decorate. And so we dug and dug and dug underneath that tree until we had this huge hole underneath that tree. I don't know why it didn't fall in. I, but we played in that all the time. It was, it was great. I don't know what we did, but we just, you know, decorated it, and it was some place to go hide from the parents and stuff like that. But it was one of the fun things we did. <laughs> good memories. Good, good memories. memories. Very Is good there memory. anything else you'd like to add to the wonderful production that we're doing here today? <laughs> oh, I think I've taken up a lot of time and talked a lot. Um, I think I've said it all. Okay. And I pretty much... Are you ready to pack up and move away from Rochester? Oh, no, 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 no. As a matter of fact, back if we go back many, many years, um, 65, 66, back in that time frame, uh, Rod and I decided that we wanted to uh, move to California, the land of milk and honey. My daughter was two years old. I thought my dad and my mother both, even though they were divorced, they both were going to kill us because we're taking their only two-year-old grandchild to California where they might never see her again. And it was just unbelievable. But we sold everything we owned and took a three-by-seven-foot trailer and put it on the back of our Chevy Impala and drove out to California. And Rod's folks had lived out there. He was, his dad was transferred out there. So we knew we had some place to go to, to spend the first night until we found an apartment. Um, anyway, the worst thing in the world we could have ever done. It, it was just horrible. I hated it from the minute I got there. I wanted to come home, and in nine months we were back. My roots were tugging on me so bad. And you're still here. And I'm still here, and I'm not going anywhere. In fact, I have a hill in my backyard that I would love to be planted in. <laughs> Okay. Which well, will never happen, I know, but... <laughs> <laughs> Sue, thank you so much. This has well, been just delightful it's to been have fun. a chance to share your memories. It's been fun. Mm -hmm.